My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCann.com. This podcast is entitled, Turning Pump Jacks into Robots Using Edge Computing. Oil and gas companies have so many assets running far, far away from civilization, it's a wonder that more are not getting an automation makeover using edge computing. What is edge computing? Well, pull up Google Earth on your device and zero in on Odessa, Texas, heart of the Permian oil basin revolution in the United States. Pan in any direction, and all you can see are well pads laid out in a neat checkerboard pattern. But what you don't see are the trappings of modern civilization, big cities. All that oil infrastructure is far away from where people actually want to live because it's hot, dry, and inhospitable. Finding highly skilled talent in places like this is a stretch. Limited school choices, long commutes, and isolated living. Oil companies find it similarly difficult to find the talent they need in parts of rural Saskatchewan and Alberta, the Bakken Basin found in North Dakota, the shale basins in northern BC, and of course, the vast stretches of Texas. But that oil equipment still needs to be supervised. Wells, considered a pretty sensitive asset, are typically connected to a traditional SCADA system that captures a number of variables about well performance and feeds that back to a control room somewhere. Even the term SCADA belies its bias, supervisory control, and data acquisition. It's about pulling data from a controlled asset during operations, but not to analyze that data and take action. When SCADA architectures were first evolved around 1960 or thereabouts, the notion that you could place a computer at the site of the well, at the edge as opposed to the center, was unheard of. It was too costly. For the enormously profitable and huge producing wells, however, it makes solid economic sense to allocate a team of production engineers to take all of the data from that SCADA system, build Excel models, figure out how to tune well performance, and do that every day. A single offshore platform will be richly endowed with this kind of human talent. But the vast majority of onshore wells are in fact very low production, just a few barrels per day, and their productivity is in constant decline as the wells slowly drain the reservoirs. These wells receive little analytic attention because they're marginal. The general rule is to leave them on and leave them to run. Anecdotally, as much as 85% of the onshore wells in North America are run this way. I liken them to being planes on autopilot, except they fly exactly the same way without regard to the load they carry, the weather they encounter, the cost of fuel, the travel distance, and the negative impacts on the equipment. It's not at all uncommon to find oil companies with large fleets of producing but marginal wells. Big oil companies then trim their portfolios by selling off older wells as they age and decline. Makes little sense to tie up capital in wells that do not generate the same returns as the best wells. Other oil companies buy up these assets and in the process build up their portfolios, and they apply their smarts to these wells and extend their productive lives. In time, the new owners, too, are forced to trim the portfolio, and the cycle continues, with wells constantly changing hands until finally the well is abandoned when no one thinks they can make a buck with it. This scenario illustrates some of the prevailing orthodoxies of the oil and gas industry. Number one, low-volume marginally economic wells do not warrant or cannot afford much analytic attention. Number two, technology costs are too high to equip modern, remote, marginal assets with anything other than SCADA. Number three, run these marginal wells hard. And number four, abandon or sell the wells when they are uneconomic in your business model. I suppose when oil prices are strong and everyone is making money, this situation is acceptable. But in this new era of low prices forever, hot competition, more demanding regulation, there's pressure to do better. And new technologies are finally making it possible to revisit these industry orthodoxies and do things differently. One of the key ways to keep a well productive is to supply it with artificial lift, or a pump that pulls fluid and gas from the well. Once the natural pressure from the earth decreases, pumps become necessary, which is why they're so common. These pumps are a regular sight throughout oil production country, there's a million of them, and they look like a horse's head bobbing up and down if the horse was eating grass and not lifting oil to the surface. The rocking motion pushes a shiny rod, called the sucker, attached to the horse's head down the well to a set of valves that open and close to let fluids flow in and be lifted up. 
The reason the contraption is so large is because of all of the weight of that steel rod, the weight of the liquids being lifted up, the depth of the well, and the size of the wellbore. Operating the pumps efficiently is trickier than it sounds. The weight of the liquids can vary as the fluids coming to the surface might be a shifting concoction of gas, water, and oil. The volumes might be off as the well slowly peters out. The well and the rod might pull progressively less and less volume of anything. And the cost of fuel or electricity to run the motor to move the pump varies. Even the value of the product being lifted up might be too low to justify bringing it to the surface. Pumps might be working too hard for too little, which causes unnecessary wear and tear on the pump, consumes costly emissions-laden fuel, and ruins the economics of the well. Or pumps might not be working hard enough, which reduces their revenue. Or the pumps experience mishaps and upsets, such as water slugs on a gas well, or reductions in lubrication or pressure problems. Engineers know all of this, of course. They've been running these wells for years. The efficiency formula are well understood. The mishaps, upsets, and issues reveal themselves in the data. The actions to be taken are documented. But the problem is, they haven't the time to gather and analyze the data constantly as the conditions vary for the hundreds of thousands of marginal wells. There are simply too few production engineers for the sheer number of wells. Add in the remote location of the assets, the lack of real-time data, and the complexity of the analysis, and voila! A recipe for artificial intelligence at scale. Digital to the rescue. How might new technologies be configured to tackle this problem of making pumps more efficient? Enter the power of digital. Number one, place an actual computer at the pump site to supplement the data being backhauled via SCADA to a control room and run it using the power already being supplied to the pump. This is the edge device. Number two, Run on that computer an onboard artificial intelligence engine that constantly takes data readings from the pump, interprets the data, and adjusts the performance of the pump to optimize production. The pump becomes a self-running, self-optimizing robot. Number three, move the data in the software to and from the artificial intelligence engine using a cloud computing environment rather than SCADA. Capture pump data for reporting and share AI-generated insights across all similar AI engines on all of the other pumps. Use the cloud to send software updates to the AI engine. Now, the pump begins to look like a smartphone equipped with an app store. And finally, equip the computer in the site with the latest encryption code, light-duty satellite uplinks, patch applications, and app managers, and all the other tools to give it autonomy. This kind of solution really delivers the goods. It brings human-level expertise, as codified in the AI engine, to those wells that get little to no attention now. Human talent is ultimately better utilized. And by reducing overpumping, operating costs fall because of lower maintenance costs and lower fuel costs. Production increases to the optimal level and stays at the optimal level, responding much better to reservoir changes. And revenues from the well are optimized, though not necessarily maximized. The wells, when they are sold, can fetch a higher price as they are more valuable. Or, put another way, growth companies can bid slightly more for wells that could be equipped with these digital smarts. Infrastructure utilization, for things like flow lines and batteries, also improves, which helps returns to shareholders. This technology also gets better over time, as the AI engine ingests more and more data from more and more wells. Best of all, the AI engines can be moved to another well once the economics are thoroughly depleted. For regular listeners to this podcast, you might recall my nifty framework for thinking about digital. Number one, digital is all about data. Number two, the Internet of Things generate the data. Number three, artificial intelligence interprets the data. Number four, robots will apply the data. Number five, cloud stores the data. The pump rod solution is a perfect illustration of how these digital tools can be creatively combined to solve real-world problems. Better still, the solution is already in the market and delivered by Ambient, a leader in improving artificial lift systems in oil and gas using digital. After just a few weeks on the job, customers report that Ambient's engines deliver up to 5% gains in production and up to a 10% reduction in operating costs. On a 100-well site producing 25 barrels per day per well, that's like having an extra five wells, which could be worth several million dollars in avoided capital spend. 
The smart oil and gas operator should be actively converting its dumb horse iron into artificially intelligent autonomous production units or risk being left behind in this new horse race. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil and Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.